take your seats. We are, we are packing so much content in today that we are not giving you a lunch break. So sorry about that, but uh, we appreciate you spending your lunch break here. Um, the schedule says that this is going to be given by Arthur Geese. The original uh, talk was pitched by Russ Pitts. And uh, both of those people are great, have great insights, I'm sure, but they also have jobs. And the jobs uh, came up, things came up. So they are not here, but uh, Carolyn Coe is going to be uh, giving Russ's Arthur's talk. Because I'm really excited about this. This talk is not about how to write a video game. It's about how to write about video games. And that part of writing in the video game industry is just as important. So uh, we're going to get a, a look at how reviewers play our games. So if you're a developer, uh, this is a really great insight into um, how, what it is that they're looking for when you're writing a game. It's always like, oh my gosh, are they going to get it? Am, are, you know, am I going to get good reviews on this? So uh, knowing your audience is always important as a writer. We know that. And uh, so Carolyn's going to give us some insight into what it's like how to play our games. Thank you. Hello, everyone. First of all, I don't know if every, anybody's familiar with what I do, but I've been writing, I've been reviewing games for 10 years. I, in the past, I was with Stratix, PC.IGN.com. I've written for Escapist and also reviewed Facebook games for Insight Social Media. Currently, I'm writing at MMORPG.com, which I've, I've reviewed games for since 2004, and Common Sense Media since 2007, I believe. Back at magazines uh, since, two, uh, since about the same time, 2007, 2008. Now, how I review games. All websites, or all the A websites anyway, have criteria and style guides. And that is what I have in hand when I'm looking at a game, when I'm playing a game. For example, pc.ign.com, and you can see this just by reading reviews, has got presentation, graphics, sound, Gameplay, lasting appeal, and an overall score. It's all scored 1 to 10. The overall score is not an average of the categories. And the website tells you that exactly as well. For MMORPG, we use graphics aesthetics. Pretty self-explanatory. What does it look like? You know, uh, is the animation nice? Is there customization? Is there variety in the landscape? Uh, they're pretty, picture, uh, pretty pictures, pretty colors, all comes into it. Gameplay is the largest um, area or the largest category because everything else, everything is in here. Your story, your content, your features, where the combat works, and as most MMOs are about combat, that's very important. It's also all about your other systems as well. Do you have pet system? What, what extends the content? So that's really big. We have innovation, which is actually is an optional category because sometimes there just isn't any. You just, it's the same old gameplay. You kill something, you kill 10 rats, you, get a, you, you finish a quest. Polish. Polish um, is uh, similar to IGN's uh, presentation. It has, it talks, this talks about, and this actually brings up what's the really the cream of the crop. This is about whether the animations look good or whether they are stilted, whether your models intersect with the equipment and the, <coughs> and the swords, whether there is a great search and filtering system in the auction house or just an auction house. This plays a, this plays a large, actually plays a large part, especially when you are uh, reviewing a launch. Um, if your launch is good, you get higher marks in polish. Social is an MMO. So you've thought, so I'm looking at what social um, features there are. Are there clan? Is there clan housing? Is there 
uh, clan and guild management tools? Is there a mentoring system that allows uh, differing level players to play together? And what's, what is chat like? Is it friendly? Are people helpful or do you get yelled down every time? Are there official forums? Are the official forums helpful? You know, are the GMs and the devs on the forums to help people? Are they talking? Longevity. Longevity is the same as IGN's uh, lasting appeal. That's where we stick our necks out <laughs> because we have to uh, give a reason and a grade to whether this game is going to last or if it's going to bomb. Finally, we have value. Value is things like, is this game worth it? Is it worth the, worth the $60, uh, $60 price tag and the $14.99 subscription? If it's a free-to-play game, are you paying $20 for a mount or 80, how much was it? $180 for the Monocle and Eve? <laughs> you know, you have things like, does bank, is increasing your bank inventory two bucks or is it 20 bucks? So that's value. And finally, we have the score, which is a, again, a one to, uh, it's an average, this one. And sometimes what it ha does help the reviewer do is figure out when they look at that average score, gee, did I score one category too high did, or did I score it too low or actually whether is the game did the, is the game really actually better or worse than what I thought it was? And I find that it's, it's helpful here. In MMORPG, we also do a list of pros and cons. That's uh, things like, okay, this is great, this is nasty, this was fun, this wasn't. Because we want to give more than just a numbered score. Because too many gamers we find just look at the score and nothing else. And <laughs> that doesn't work. But one, thing, one other thing that we do at MMORPG is that each game is reviewed on its own merit, which is to say we cannot compare a 2D side-scrolling game like Maple Story to um, Star Wars The Old Republic. We just can't because they are definitely different games. And that's how I uh, review for MMORPG. As a huge contrast, this is how I review for Common Sense Media. Common Sense Media is a parental advisory. A lot of parents look at this to look at games and see whether it's suitable for their children. I review mature games, mature MMOs, as well as little, little kitty MMOs. And a game like could get, a, uh, could get four stars, even five mm. stars, but it's not suitable for children. The Secret World, for example, a mature game, lots of gore, lots of blood, lots of cussing. So again, we have criteria, and these are the criteria that I review the game with. And this is for any game, for casual games, for DS games, for PSP games to MMOs. First, there are positive messages. Most of this is found in the story, especially the backstory, and when talking to NPCs. Is the, is the story about light and dark, or is, it, or is it about good and evil? Can you play these factions again? And that's important because parents don't want their kids playing an evil faction. Positive role models. I am looking for these in both NPCs as well as, um, as, well as avatars because, uh, again, I'm talking to NPCs. You know, are they telling me, oh, help me protect the village, there are vampires attacking us? Or are they telling me, oh, go kill those awful vampires, they killed my daughter, I want revenge. Big difference in positive in role models there. And it's amazing what you find in a game sometimes. Uh, not too long ago, this uh, children's game was released. All the NPCs, all the trainers were white male or animals. There were two females in the entire game, and one was a cow in a kimono. <laughs> Do you remember? Anybody named that game? Wizard 101. The only, that, exactly two females when the game launched, and one was a cow in a kimono. Like an actual cow? Yes, an actual cow. A cow in a kimono. You can imagine, you know, a lot of Asian mothers really want their girl, little girls to play that game. <laughs> <laughs> then we go to ease of play. Ease of play includes 
everything from the UI to the tutorials. You know, uh, are there tool tips? Is the tutorial uh, repeatable? Um, are the cam camera angles awkward? Are there complex systems? Or is it just a cookie cutter? Oh, this is a paladin and you play him. Violence is always an interesting one because there are, there's violence and there's violence, and there is a difference between human heads falling off and cartoon violence. But cartoon violence is still violence. And one more thing, if you have gore, if you have a switch that turns it off, that's great. <laughs> Sex. This is the interesting one because of how games are written that we, sometimes it's just unnecessary. It doesn't forward the story at all. And here's an ex actual example. This was a little hidden object game, RPG, really neat. And as a real, as for, as a great story. You had a prince and a princess. At first, they disdained each other, and they got trapped in a dungeon. At first, they disdained each other's help. They were snooty. They were mean to each other. So the princess was wearing a bit of a low-cut ball gown, but who cares, right? All princesses have low-cut ball gowns. <laughs> Oops, gratuitous booby, booby shot. <laughs> you know, that's... You know, for kids. For kids, yeah. <laughs> Why? It's un totally unnecessary, but you know, uh, you get marked down. Then we have language. Language covers things like whether Kids are insulting each other, calling each other stupid and dumb, or they are using things like denigratory words or, or cuss words. That's language. Then you have consumerism. Uh, are they selling anything in the game? Is there the Pepsi sign in the background? A Gap store in your game? Are you telling kids, oh, collect more Siasia pads? All that is uh, uh, in-game advertising for free games also is involved in that. Then we have drinking, drugs, and smoking. Again, that's pretty self-explanatory, but there's a difference between something in the background and, you know, for high fantasy games, taverns and elven ale, there's a difference between having it there and whether they, the kids can go in the bar, buy a drink, drink it, get drunk, tunnel vision. And the other one for modern games and science fiction games are stims. Call it anything else but stims, and you'll get a pass on the drugs. I mean, high fantasy games call them buffs. Buffs? Buffs are okay, it's a spell. <laughs> but I've got stims that I inject myself. Oh, drugs. <laughs> and that's as simple. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> as simple as that. Finally, we have privacy and safety for common sense media. And that is basically making sure it's cover compliant, how easy it is for kids to report players that are... Um, that are doing nasty, the naughty things, whether there is a uh, 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 age filters, whether there are different kinds of, um, of ways to make friends lists and things like that. So that's it for Common Sense Media, except that we, do, we recently launched was um, the educational ratings. And this is how much can kids learn from a game. You know, in MMOs, there's always teamwork. You have to have teamwork or you'll never get anywhere. But other things like social studies, maybe you have got civilized, maybe it's a civilization and you are learning things about culture, history, and physics, science, things like that. But so, that's it. That's how I play games that I review. I have a list of criteria in mind when I go into playing the game. And Let's have my panel members up. Tom, Abernathy, and yeah, Wendy. I'm like yeah, I'm taking the place of, of somebody who had to run off and do their job. Our jobs keep getting in the way of us having fun. Jobs, so. jobs, yeah, jobs, 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 jobs. Okay, questions or comments? So uh, I, I want to start off if okay, I can. Of um, I think it's... Uh, Really interesting to think of the the projects that I'm on now and have in the past. When I when I look at them in terms of of that list, it often feels restrictive to me when the um, suits come down and say you cannot have that glass of wine in that game. But then when I look at it 
from that perspective, I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't mean that much to me to have a glass of wine if it's going to make a difference to a reviewer. So I, I kind of opened my eyes to thinking of it in ways that are uh, a little less restrictive and a little more like, oh, take, take my audience into account. Hmm. The other thing that, that, would, that I would ask um, is, is there, is it an either or binary checklist, basically? I mean, in other words, like, if there's a glass of wine, if there's a cigarette, box is checked, parents don't, don't let your kids play this, or is there, do, are you allowed to take into uh, account the context or the, uh, if you will, sort of the, the moral perspective that's placed on that? In other words, let's say that I write something with somebody who likes a cigarette, but somebody else, I'm being very simplistic, somebody else criticizes them and, and tells them they shouldn't, they put it out. Does, uh, to me, there's a qualitative difference there with the message that's being sent, and I wonder, I'm wondering if you have the freedom to account for that or not. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we have the freedom. Uh, it has to do with context, and not only that, we have a, slide, we have a scale of one to five. No. Oh. okay. For everything. And the thing is, um, what triggers the whether it's a good game or not a game, or uh, not a game for kids, is also the number you score on all those categories mm. on a scale to one to five. So does it end up with a, a final one to five score at the end? Is that averaged as well? No, there is a, there is a five, uh, one to five star for how good the game is. That is irrespective of all those categories. What is good mean? Categories. Good for kids? Uh, and there is a diff another score that whether it's good for kids. I see. Oh. Okay. And whether it's good for kids is dependent on all those categories. Okay, so, so let's say, because I have a game right now that I'm writing which is, which is aimed, um, uh, for, uh, aiming for a T rating. Um, and there's a character in it who uh, my sort of, uh, my vision for him is that he's, he's a sort of <coughs> Captain Ahab character come... Han Solo or Malcolm Reynolds, if their lives had not gone very well, and 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 that that he's uh, you know sort of a poet philosopher at heart, but he's been crushed enough times that 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 um, he he has a tendency to drink a lot. I'm probably not going to show him drinking in the game, but that's an element of his personality. It's not meant to be uh, necessarily a salutary element aspect of his personality, but it's but it it, it is it, it it's part of who he is. How would you? What would you? say about that in review, how would you... Know, that, how would you but that would be rated as a one because do characters drink? Yes, one of them drinks, but... And then you go into the why he drinks uh -huh. and whether it is, uh, you know, if, if it's celebrating drinking right. or whether this right. guy is just because <laughs> of his background and all that he drinks. And also the important thing is how that matters to the protagonist. Right, right. Okay, hmm. cool. Tell me a question. Yes. I I've been reviewing games for about two years for miscellaneous websites, and I think it's worth pointing out that even though the style guide is very important, there are many, many other publications that don't necessarily follow the same one. You know, like, um, Common Sense Media is a very, very niche audience in the game reviewing class. Yes. Because I know that personally, like, from many of the sites that I'll like review for, like, once I've played the game, I kind of sit down and think, okay, well, these were the big, you know, bullet points that stood out for me. This was my experience. And so I will, you know, kind of start off immediately by saying, well, in, you know, Batman, I've, you know, been reading, ba or, you know, Arkham City, I've been, you know, loving and playing Batman for years, so it was fascinating just to see the twists on the medium and so it would rant about Batman forever, and so it really, like, I feel like the biggest tip that I could give to game developers wanting to write, talk to reviewers is in just the press sheet say, this is what we were going for. You know, hopefully you will find that these moments are just as impactful for you as they were when we developed them. So really, you're talking to marketing. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, reviewer guides. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about reviewer guides now, Ben. Those are very important. And yeah. unfortunately, I think I get, for every 10 games I review, I get one reviewer guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. Can you guys go into what makes a good reviewer guide? I think, personally, it's almost as simple as an artist statement. Give us probably no more than a page saying we spent three years making this, you know, we took ideas instead sort of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness or whatever, and we, you know, put it in Africa and kind of took, you know, far cry ideals and made this game. You know, really try to 
So you just kind of explain where you were going with the game. It'll help us kind of focus that lens to see how well did you do this, and how well did our, exper our experience is kind of match what you were going, match what you were going for. Wait, uh, um, with um, Tim Schafer's *Brutal Legend*, like everybody played that game, thinking about how you know the entire atmosphere was developed around a heavy metal album cover, because that was you know kind of the phrase that was hammered into everybody. And I think it worked really well in terms of letting people know what they were playing. Where MMOs are concerned, you want to give them, a, for a reviewer guide, you want to have a list of game features, as well as anything that you want the, you as the developer, want the review, reviewer to see. Because there is just so much game content to get through on any RPG or, or MMO. You know, this is your time to tell them, oh, look at this. Tell them what you're proud of. For a game like... Uh, uh, or for a site like Common Sense Media, you want to tell them what your parental controls are. And because what we, I also do when I review uh, games for, ES, for uh, Common Sense Media is look at the ESRB as well as the PEGI ratings, because there I would find where all the, why it was rated such a way. So from a developer's perspective, uh, when one of my games comes out, I'm I'm excited to read reviews about it, but I'm also terrified to read reviews about it. And, and sometimes I will ask friends to go read the reviews first and then tell me whether or not I should read it or if I should skip it or if it has interesting things to say about the game or if they totally missed it. Um, as, a, as a reviewer, do you hope that the developers will read what you have to say, or are you mostly just thinking about the audience? I'm mostly thinking about the audience, but I hope the developers also read what I have to say, especially in the kids' games area. <laughs> uh, because a lot of times, a lot of times I also provide feedback um, by email, <clears throat> because uh, depending on how close I am to the, the game company I'm working with, wh who's helping me with this email, I also, provide, um, I also provide feedback. But the thing is this, a lot of times I really want a review guide because for a game like an MMO, what if I went this direction instead of that direction and totally missed this fabulous content you have there? It happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, Sorry, I'm, I'm just turning that idea around in my head because because I've it never even occurred to me. Um, you say you get one out of ten times you get a reviewer's guide. I've never heard of anybody making a reviewer's guide, frankly. Uh, and, yeah, I'm and, here. And, and, and <laughs> I was surprised that the, the percentage was that high. Um, and and uh, it's interesting because um, generally when you get around to the point of doing press for stuff, um, uh, it's n it's not oriented particularly towards giving people any kind of nuanced idea of where you were coming from, I think most of the time, it's usually more about sort of selling whatever the splashy, spectacular aspects, uh, whatever the hooks are, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and the second thing, and I'm, I, by no means do I mean to denigrate the class of people that I'm about to mention, but, but, <laughs> it, but it usually is just, say, a creative director or a producer or maybe a lead designer. Um, rarely, um, uh, you get other people, like we did some developer diaries for Rush that actually had a whole cross-section of people on the team, which, which I thought was really cool. But, but you, you, you probably get a somewhat limited perspective on some of that stuff, especially if they haven't thought about it. And I'm just, I'm starting to think now as a result of what you're saying about how we can be more proactive about shaping the message um, uh, in a more in-depth, uh, complex way that we want you guys, as you're talking about, to, to have so that you can then be looking at what we've done with an educated eye. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think from a, a writer's perspective, it's easy for us to say, um, I want the work to stand on its own. You know, I don't want to tell you all of the good parts because I want you right. to go experience it and be surprised by it and excited by it. That I don't want to spoil you. Um, but it's interesting that you said an artist statement because my sister is an artist and, and does actual art that hangs in galleries and, and does artist statements. And, you know, we, we throw around this idea that games are art, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about an artist statement for a game that, hmm. you know, that kind of took it in mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. direction where we're actually trying to tell you what we 
we're thinking because we're so afraid of spoiling things. Well, also, I don't think most of the time people. Are, I mean, most of the people who 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 do what we do, not specifically what you and I do, yeah. but um, uh, uh, aren't thinking of it as art. They're thinking of it as as a product. Yeah. And I don't know if if you if you think about products in that same way, or maybe you do. Maybe people who market products actually do come up with things like that. I don't know. I don't think so. But you see, so. I, I, th I think sometimes an artist statement like he like he described, you know, gives you a little background, gives you a little more than just the story that you read in online. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I would be afraid of telling you the good parts and having you put in your review. Well, they said they were appro you know approached it this way, but they really failed. You know, <laughs> whereas if I hadn't told you what the good parts were, you'd be like, yeah, it, it tells this other story pretty well, you know, and, and so I, it's almost like, well, if I don't tell, maybe they won't see the ugly parts that, you know, I wasn't perfect at. That's funny, because I think I feel the opposite, actually. Yeah. Like, I, like, I always have this feeling of, if I can just explain myself enough, oh, you'll get it, <laughs> you'll get me, you know? So, so I feel like if you, if you give me the opportunity to, like, go on for 14 pages about what I was trying to do, then it'll all be really clear. Then, you, then you'll get it and give me a good review. Um. I think we've got a question out there. Uh, when you actually do get a reviewer's guide, what channel does it really come from? Is it like sent to you? Do you find it posted somewhere? Oh, it's sent to me. Yeah. Usually sent to me with the game. It's not not so much spoilers. You don't have to give spoilers. You just want to give a point. That's, that's the hard part about writing a reviewer's guide, I think, whether you spoil or point in a direction. Sure. Well, like you were saying, you're talking about, or somebody was talking about inspirations, right? Um, like like the Conrad thing. I mean, you know, like like if we had done that when I was at Pandemic for, for Saboteur, we could have gone, uh, you know, obviously in A. Jones, but we're also looking at, at Casablanca. We're looking at uh, Where Eagles Dare and, 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 and the train and give sort of get an idea of, of where some of the cinematic things were and, mm -hmm. and all that. So, so it's more about where you're coming from and what you're aiming at than sort of giving a specific, like a synopsis. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But you see, reviewers' guides sometimes can be really important. You know, the game I just showed about the, with, the, with the booby shot. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Boobies for kids. But you see, I played the game, did the puzzles, did, and I thought, finally, the protagonists were walking across, the prince and princess were walking across the drawbridge, hand in hand, into the sunset. I thought, okay, end of game, shut down. Hmm, pretty short for a $10 game. Then I gave it to my nine-year-old niece. A week, you know, luckily before I had the interview written because she, a few days later she tells me that was the greatest game I ever played it was so neat but my favorite part was when the prince and princess walked across the bridge and they collapsed I missed half the game yeah. <laughs> yeah. I missed half the game <laughs> Hmm. So, <laughs> you know? That's bad. Yeah, as, as a developer, I'm going, oh, I can so see how that would happen. You, and uh, Carol, yeah. you, you seem like you, you approach what you do with a lot of integrity and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, really sort of strong uh, values and, and, and that sort of thing. Do you, do you uh, I'm asking this completely ingenuously. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you feel like you are fairly representative of game reviewers, or do you feel like that... that that, uh, that approach is somewhat unusual. You know, for all the game reviews I've, I've talked to, especially the ones that have been re reviewing as long as I have, we have to be uh, fairly straightforward, honest, uh, to be able to have done it so long. Mm. That's all I can, that's what I'll say. It's easy for developers to get jaded about it and say, well, you know, they didn't like it because it didn't come from their favorite studio or whatever, mm -hmm. but... Or because it's not Gears of War and that's Because it's like. not Gears... Yeah, whatever. Yeah. It, it's, it's easy for us to make up excuses for why the reviewers didn't like it, uh, you know, instead of saying, well, it, maybe it's for the reasons they say in the review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but after saying something like that, I'll have to say that you know, the majority of reviewers these days haven't got much experience. Mm -hmm. They last about two or three years and then, you know, the day job takes them back away from what they used to do. The life happens, and they and they stop reviewing because most uh, most game reviewers have day jobs. I've got a day job, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's unfortunately, that's the that's the way the industry works. There are there sure. are millions of B sites that hardly ever make enough um, views to get to E three, but and all these are eighteen to eighteen to twenty five year old males. Half of them are still in school. 
and the other half have uh, day jobs and they are just doing it for a free game. Mm -hmm. They love the game. I like to play this game, but they love the game. I want to play Halo. I want to get a beta. So I'm going to volunteer as a game writer. I think that's the thing that, that worries us. Because I, I think a lot of the time we feel, I mean, I, I, would, I would love for anything that I do to be reviewed by somebody like you. I think a lot of times th that we feel that, um, that our, our stuff, four times out of five anyway, is, is being reviewed by people who don't have an, an informed sort of perspective on it, who, who, who are going to reject a lot of things out of hand because they're not Halo or Gears of War or, or whatever. Um, and, and that it's tough to get a fair shake, an intelligent shake. Because because sometimes they're just not putting the effort in in that way. But maybe that's not a, a fair perception. The thing is, when that happens, or when that uh, when you are going to a site that you know has lots of this kind of reviewers, that's when you <coughs> have to, that's when the PR person, whoever is um, is uh, connecting with this site and the editor, just has to take that extra step mm -hmm. in into making sure that the the writer is the right person. I mean, God's truth. I've seen this uh, happen on PCIGN. Uh, some, a writer opened this review by saying, I don't know what I did to piss my editor off, but I'm <laughs> reviewing this kid's game. Yeah, I, w I was going to say, I've, I've done some kid's games, and they've gotten some scathing reviews saying, well, it might be fun for kids, but... Right. And I'm like, well, that was the main audience. <laughs> I'm hoping right. it's fun That's for right. kids. And they don't get a yeah. seven-year-old to write the review, so... Yeah. And, and they don't ask a seven-year-old to play it and then right. talk to them That's about right. it, so... I wonder something myself, and you know, I don't want to. You know, I, I was yesterday, you know, worrying about these things. Another thing, you know, I notice when I go to review sites, I'm trying to watch them more because I'm getting closer to releasing something. I've got a ways to go, and I'll be enjoying a site. I won't name any, and uh, you know, and they're talking about this indie game and that big game and this thing coming up in a year and what this person's working on, and then Skyrim is coming, and then Skyrim is coming, and then Skyrim has buttons. And Skyrim has joined. And it's like, this couldn't be, they couldn't really want to write about this three times a day. And sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm wondering if, if, if there's, if it is the case, as we're talking about honesty of some of the reviewers and stuff, if some sites are, let's just throw it out there, are paid to, you know, constantly uh, cheerlead certain big games or something. Because it kind of turns me up. You know, I stop wanting to read that site if I have to just watch Batman's Arkham Asylum and Skyrim three or four times a day. Right, as everyone compares every game to those three. Mm. Don't forget StarCraft too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It goes from they, they actually have a pretty good twist on it, like it's got a new kind of graphic or a new kind of AI, and then it starts going into, oh, the buckets are funny. And it just goes on into the detail that I don't think anybody really review or write about or be interested in that news. What, what, what's going on there? Is that really just through a, some reviewer or some news outlet's extreme interest in the game and love of the game? Yes, <laughs> that's all it is, you yeah. know. They get excited about the game. And also a lot of these smaller, don't forget that a lot of these smaller sites are run by volunteers. Mm -hmm. they, they, started right, they started the site because of a game. Enthusiasm. You know, enthusiasm, they love the game, they keep on writing about the game. But, oh, but we could make money with this. Let's see if we can get advertising and, they, and then they grow. But it's usually... And then when they hire people, they, you know, similar types. They hire similar types of people or the people that want to write for them. And don't forget, these are all volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, right? So uh, hire the volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Usually that's what it is, They're, especially if they, are, uh, if they are fan sites. Must love Skyrim, must know about this, must know about that. <laughs> and, and your compensation is... Uh, you get a copy of the game and, ooh, E3. <laughs> and, and I will say, just to be fair, that a lot of writers have gotten a good start and it gives them sure. a lot of good practice writing for these volunteer sites. So it's not like we should, you know, oh, ban no. them or anything. No, no. That's how I started. But, Absolutely. yeah. But That's how I started. I, it's nice to hear that, that reviewers, at least some reviewers, aspire for more than that. Yeah, and it, I mean, the, <laughs> I, can't, I, I mean, the thing too is it, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't inspire confidence when you see things that clearly haven't been copy edited anyway mm -hmm. that 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 don't that don't they aren't well written. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, if if if, if it's, a, it's a writing task that isn't well written, and it sort of makes it makes me as a writer and narrative designer go, well, okay, you're not putting 
the same energy into what you're doing that I'm putting into what I'm doing. And yet you're judging me. And yet you're judging yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are, then I love it. Because truly, yeah. I mean, there's nothing, I think Wendy will agree with me, there's nothing that, that we like better than the informed perspective of somebody who has insights on what we've done that we don't necessarily even have and that can, that can help us think about what we've done in new ways and we, then we can carry that forward into work in the future. Well, a lot of times you end up getting so laser focused <clears throat> on your part of the game yeah. that it's hard to look at the game as a whole when you're a developer. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, mm -hmm. to judge it as, as a whole. So it is really valuable to have good reviewers um, and, well, and they bring insights that... Okay. Now, this is from the perspective of the full-time reviewer. I've known a few. I actually have known a few full-time <laughs> reviewers. They exist. They I was going to say, Russ and Arthur are both full-time <laughs> reviewers. Yeah. That's you not here. That gets them. But, yeah. What they love is because they have to, uh, this is their living. You know, they want to look good for games. They're looking for games. They're pitching games. They're pitching games to every magazine, every outlet they know. So what is important for these guys is access. 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 Early access. Access to a developer, access to someone that can tell them more about the game so that they can pitch it and they can look at it early enough and, read, and have an, enough time to review it so that the review hits when it launches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I heard there were some sites, um, I think Kotaku might be local, but there are other like, sites that are kind of smaller that look, that when they review, they look specifically for early access in order to review a game. Hmm. Oh, yes, because, you know. That was, that was in Kotaku. Yes, because uh, early access which means they can review the game on time for launch, which means uh, more eyeballs and right. more advertising right. dollars. But from a developer's perspective, that's terrifying because it the is. game is not done until the very it last is. minute. Um, and so especially when polish is on your list of criteria that you're looking for, it is not polished three weeks before it goes out. Right. You spend those last three weeks entirely on polish. And so if you're letting a reviewer look at it at that unfinished stage it's it is terrifying and it's it, because a bad review on the day the game comes out is you know just as terrible as no review it was worse than no review so yeah. um, I, I want to point out that like I am a journalism student training to be a journalist and therefore like reviewing games is a much more like literary side thing to what I do and I got to concur that access is probably the most interesting thing sure. in the position, almost beyond just getting a free copy of the game, being able to talk to a developer, or even a PR person, about what is this game tends to make a much more interesting story, and something that you know a journalist would be happier to put on their website <laughs> than just a game that showed up in the mail. Like, like I kind of said earlier about you know the artist statement, or just the review sheet, any information you can give us in any way, shape, or form makes for a better story, and it makes for a much more interesting you know, article. Um, this is a question more, I guess, on the journalism side, although I'd certainly be interested to hear what, what the devs and, and writers think about it. And that is, uh, one thing I found really interesting is whenever I think, whenever we tend to think about reviewing games, we tend to think of it a, a little bit like that, uh, the list of criteria that you have for MMORPG, so you know, graphics, sound, you know, gameplay, polish, da 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 da, -da. Um, <coughs> And I found, in contrast, your, your list of criteria for common sense really interesting, like I've never really thought to sort of approach a game in that way. Now, with the, you know, with the online, you know, video game journalism market so kind of saturated with, you know, tons of sites that are dealing with graphics, presentation, da 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 do you think there's room for more people to, like, adopt those kind of niche uh, criteria and approach games from that way? Like, will we start seeing maybe publications that you know, I'm judging the game on story, characters, dialogue, you know, like just the story, or maybe someone else who's like, I'm looking at it in terms of, you know, social, like, I think there are blogs that do like, you know, social justice, you know, approach to games. Like, do you think that that's, you know, going to be the way that game journalism goes? Maybe finding those more niche, like, criteria for, for reviewing games? I don't really think so, because that doesn't pay. <laughs> 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 Common Sense Media is a nonprofit organization. Do you think, what about the chances of, you, you said that, uh, that everything else, including stories, included in the gameplay rating, uh, can, we, can, I, can I lobby to get 
story broken yeah. out of gameplay because <laughs> yeah. I, 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 and I'm asking you to lobby for it, I guess, because because that that is something that happens on most sites, and and it makes no sense to me at all because but the the narrative element aspects of game are not the same as the gameplay elements, and and they can they are completely separable, and one of them can be awesome, and the other can be crappy. They know? they absolutely intertwine with each yes, other. Yes, certainly. But you. Yeah, it's it's a little depressing to see <laughs> that story is wrapped up there with gameplay because most of the attention will go to the combat mechanics right. instead of, you know, my year and a half of effort on the narrative design. So, but you know, um I think for writing that way is a lot has a lot to do with the review themselves because um that was how I reviewed uh Star Wars The Old Republic. I started off with saying, you know, I've been following this game a while and I played the game. Uh, you know, I've had early access here and I've had early access there. I always thought it was just eh until I got into final beta and I got into the story. Mm -hmm. right. You know, so story can be a great big part of what makes a game good. And unfortunately, like, it's lumped in there with gameplay. Right, yeah. exactly. Okay. Call's going out. Tell everybody no. Break out. Yeah. So I have one last thing to to bring up. It's that final number at the end because I, as a contract narrative designer, mm -hmm. I have had my paycheck tied to the wow. Metacritic score. Really? We yeah. all hate it. Yeah. Uh, we okay, hate raise it. Raise your hands. Who, who's who, who's that true? Of? I hear people are. Nodding. Well, I mean, that's industry-wide. Okay. Uh, really? Yes. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. yeah, it's common. Yeah. It's and it, isolated from that. And I wouldn't say that, I mean, not my entire paycheck <clears throat> was. There was there was a, a set amount that I would get, and then if it reached 70% in for uh, Metacritic, then I'd get this bonus. And if it, and if But the problem was that this bonus was, yeah, <laughs> well, the bonus... The bonus would make it a living salary. So, you right. know, the, the base pay was crumbs and the, the bonus was entirely based on what reviewers thought of it. And so do you even take that into account when you're looking at that final number that you're giving a game? Does it ever enter your mind that, oh my gosh, people's salaries are tied to this number I'm giving? Frankly, no. I, I mean, I think that's a good thing. Right, I agree with that. But on the other hand, as, as someone who's had that, <laughs> I'm like, no, think of me. Think of the devs. <laughs> um, yeah. Think of my rent. <laughs> I've, I've been insulated from that, I Yeah, guess. You, you get to work with the big guys <laughs> where you don't, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's awful. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm truly shocked to hear that, I think. Because, it, I mean, obviously you can't go to people like Carolyn and do something about it. I mean, the, the, no, the, at the individual I mean, reviewers, the individual reviewers are powerless sure. at this and and I can't go to every reviewer and say please give this a high score because you know I need to pay rent I, but will, I will say this I, I can I can tell you because I've heard it out of his own mouth um, uh, at, at Microsoft we uh, over the last year and a half anyway are putting a lot less stock I think um, in in Metacritic mm -hmm. specifically, anyway, and I've heard Phil Spencer say that in, in, in meetings. Say, 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 let's not let's stop talking about that. I don't want to use that as the metric, um, and and that's encouraging. It is encouraging because the the big companies kind of lead the way. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this was a I'd say a mid sized company who was really looking at it from a programmers and statisticians' point of view, saying, um, you know how it. They're just aggregating all of every, <laughs> all of the review scores, so you know it's what the people think. Whether you right. know this is how we can tie it to the you know encourage you to do a good job without tying it to sales scores and things like that. Right. So um, that's the unfortunate part. Is that may be the alternative is <laughs> simply tying it to units moved and, and and dollars made. But yeah, and I don't know that I like a, that better. But as a writer, I'm you know I've written some books as well, and that's tied to royalties, and that's a whole, anyway. The the reviewers have a lot of responsibility, and I don't and I have mixed feelings about the fact that I know you don't think about how it's going to impact the Metacritic score. But <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Three, three oh. <laughs> okay, last question. Yeah, uh, 
what I was going to say, you know, your first slide, you know, I like that, and I appreciate the honesty, but I bet, I bet that, and you know, you pointed out, you, you do RPGs, and there's a certain style, of, but you know, literally you're ranking what goes into a score, and things like innovation are down at number four, and graphics are at the top, I bet that's a, that could be a hot point worth a lot of, you know, uh, you know, yeah, for MMO. Yes, for MMORPG graphics is on top. For um, PCIGN presentations on top, and presentation is uh, like polish. Mm -hmm. But tied to graphics. True, sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know why. But uh, we aren't the only site that does that. Well, and, and you're not the only site that does it. And and I have to admit that when I talk to gamers, that's what they talk about first. And I don't think it's just because that's how reviewers do it. The graphics, what it looked like. It's a very pretty game. They will often say, like, I've heard people talk about Rift and say, it's a beautiful game. I love that game, but there's not a lot to do in it. So, which is interesting from a, I don't know, a lot, very interesting in lots of ways, but, um, you know, as a gamer, I'm thinking, well, what do you do? Sure, it's nice that the scenery is good, mm -hmm. but what, what do you do when you play the game? And as a designer, I'm thinking, what do you do as you play the game? And, and a lot of gamers are thinking about how pretty it is. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting dynamic. And the reviewers are kind of stuck in between the, the two. And we'd, we'd love you to educate our audience a little more and say, well, but the, you know, forget forget the graphics. Don't get hung up on the fact that this is eight bit graphics. It's a fun game, mm -hmm. but uh, you know. Back when you buy games in a store, despite that I claim I would only care about gameplay, I like to shove a new silver box. Ooh, that box looks like a tombstone. You know, I'm not judging by its cover. Well, <laughs> and, and, and back in the good old days, you know, in the in the eighties and early nineties, you'd have a, a cover on the box that had very little to do with the game inside. Mm. You know, it was, it, it was, yeah. <laughs> okay, we are out of time. Yeah, we got it. So that's it for the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.